There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. So glad you're joining us this morning from any, how, any way that you're joining us, whether online or in person. And it is a beautiful fall, October day. Amen? I love fall. It's one of those times of the year I don't feel gross walking outside. I mean, I'm like a human space heater. I'm, it's, I sweat so easily. And so when I walk outside and it's like 50 or 60 degrees, to me, it feels like I'm walking on heaven's celestial shore. So I love it. And feel free to call me basic if you want, but I love pumpkin spice. Pumpkin spice anything. Pumpkin spice, la I see that hand. Pumpkin spice lattes, pump pancakes, tuna fish, I don't care. If you, if you pumpkin spice it, I'm going to try it, all right? I love it. <clears throat> well, this morning, we are, we are still moving along in our Rooted Message series, and it's been awesome. I mean, every message Sunday morning have been so encouraging, uh, lots of... Lots of good stuff coming out of our small groups and our mid-sized communities, powerful stories of, of, of change. So I just want to encourage you to keep sharing those stories. You know, email Pastor Brian or any of the other pastors on staff. We'd love to hear how God is, is challenging you and encouraging you, speaking to you, moving you in your community into spiritual growth. I mean, uh, we, we can never have too much encouragement. So even, even share those stories with your neighbors and your friends as well. And of course, we want to be careful to give God all the glory for what he's doing here. So with that being said, let's uh, just pray one more time and we'll get into his word this morning. <clears throat> all right. Yes, Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness to us. We desire to see your will done in our lives and in the world around us. And so thank you for giving us your living word, revealing yourself to us, and um, allowing your word and your spirit to transform us more and more into your image. And so I pray right now that you would bless us with the truth of your word and continue to use us to accomplish the good work you've prepared for us to do. And I say this with a lot of thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, today we're talking about purpose. And in the rooted books, chapters six and seven, they are titled, How Can I Make the Most of My Life? And I want to begin just by sharing a mental, two mental images with you all. I want you to think about rocks and roots. Rocks and roots. All right, now what happens if you throw a rock into the water? What happens? <clears throat> yeah, you see a splash, see little ripples throw out there. And then the ripples eventually die down and the water becomes still again. Now what happens when you throw a seed into the ground? It throws down roots. And those roots draw up nutrients. And then slowly over time, it breaks through the surface. And the roots grow down. And the seed is no longer a seed, but it becomes like a tree. And it transforms into this tree that's producing fruit. Now, what's the difference between these two images? You know, a rock is thrown into the water, and it makes it splash. But it's very short-lived. The impact is temporary. It doesn't really produce anything other than a few moments of entertainment, and the rock is lost beneath the surface of the water. Now, when you throw a seed into the ground, the, the, the roots grow down. They draw up resources, and it is slow work. You can't watch uh, the roots break out, and it's beneath the surface, but it, it breaks through the surface, and it produces something beautiful and life-giving. Now, can you guess which image God has in mind when he thinks of you? You don't have to think too hard because there's pictures on the walls here of a, of a flourishing tree by streams of water. This is God's image that he has in mind for his people when they are living in his way. And we read about this image in Psalm chapter 1. God describes you like this. That person 
is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. You were meant to become a flourishing tree planted next to a continual life-giving resource. You were meant to produce fruit and good things to bless and serve others. And you will continually stay vibrant and full of life, never withering, always flourishing. That's God's ideal for you. That's why I love this Rooted series, because we are pressing into the main things of our faith, the things that grow us and help us to flourish in Jesus. And this imagery of being rooted and flourishing in Jesus is a much better picture than a rock making a temporary splash in the water. It's a picture of God's purpose for your life. And a lot of us ask that question, what is my purpose? How do you answer that question? What is my purpose? What difference do I make? Why am I here? Now maybe you haven't asked that, those questions like that. Perhaps for you it looks like coming home from a, a long, frustrating day and you plop yourself in your chair and in your exhaustion you say, what am I doing with my life? Is this all there is? What's the point? How do you answer that question of what is my purpose? How does the world around us get answers to those questions? Well, I'll tell you where a lot of people look, and not intentionally, but all of us, without even knowing it, are receiving different answers to that question of what is my purpose from all different areas around us. Here's a few places we regularly look. We see billboards while we're driving, right? We watch TV shows, and then there's politics. There's movies and sports, commercials, the news, celebrity voices, and all of us are connected on some different social media platforms. We're all looking at some of those things pretty regularly, and they are all ready to provide their purpose for your life. In some form or another, the messages are boiled down to elevating yourself with material wealth, status, fame, or for you to become a professional consumer. We want you to make a certain amount of money and you'll be happy. Get a certain number of followers and, and attain a, some certain influence in your community. Get that next promotion. Look a certain way. Dress a certain way. Buy that dream house and fill that house with all the latest technology and gadgets. And when you think about it, there's so many entities out there fighting for your attention and purpose. You know, Netflix wants you to stay on the couch longer. All right, politicians want you to keep voting for them. Amazon wants you to buy more stuff. YouTube wants you to become a subscriber. Hit the follow button, hit the like button, upgrade your package to premium access. You know, there are false gods out there that are trying to align you to their purpose for your life. They want your attention, they want your affection, they want your money, your time, your energy but it's because they love you. They care about you. And they want you to fill your life with their good things. For three easy payments of $19.95, call today. The deal won't last forever, right? <laughs> Friends, isn't it all too easy to get sucked into that? Yes or no? Yeah. I like it when I come home for work and I pull in the driveway and I see a package waiting for me on the front porch. <laughs> you know? It makes me feel good inside. And now, there, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but it can easily become a false god when one subscription turns into the next, and this membership and that membership, and then I sign up for this streaming service, and it could become a distraction for why you're really here. You want to hear a truth bomb? When you're not clear about your purpose, you distract yourself with pleasure. Isn't that so true? If you think you're an accident and your life ultimately has no meaning, no purpose, you will treat every day as if it has no purpose and you will end up living for pleasure. Here's how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 16. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? 
This is a very important, this is a very important spiritual truth that Jesus wants us to attach our hearts to. Basically, he's saying the more you're concerned with fulfillment in your life, the less fulfilled you will be. How do you lose your soul? By distracting yourself from your true purpose, from God's purpose for your life, by filling your life with temporary things, or as Pastor Matt Chandler says, the stuff of future garage sales. Your life just becomes a bunch of little rocks making tiny splashes and ripples but not producing any fruit. This is why it's so important for you and I to turn our attention to God's word to answer that question, what is my purpose? And I'm a big fan of asking the same question that the Apostle Paul asked in Romans 4.3. He says, what does the scripture say? It's a good question, and it's a question we should all ask ourselves in every area of life. And for the area of purpose, we look to Scripture. And so here's the main point for today that we see in Scripture. It's you exist to glorify God by becoming more like God while accomplishing the work of God. That's your purpose. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. That's why you were created. But I want to use our time this morning to get more specific in answering this question and unpacking what this means to glorify God. Because right now, this point just seems a little general and vague. And so how specifically do we glorify God? What does it actually look like to become more like God? And then I want to cover two specific ways that you and I can accomplish the work of God. And so number one, you and I exist to glorify God. It's our purpose. And glory is one of those words that we use a lot, but maybe it's lost some of its meaning for us. So to to glorify means to exalt, to elevate, to worship, to make much of, to magnify, and to please. And we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God, to worship God, to please God. So eating and drinking is specific, but then whatever you, whatever you do is still kind of general. And so to answer the question, how do we glorify God, I believe the first way that we glorify him is by becoming more and more transformed into his image. And I see this in a few verses. I'll share one, one with you this morning. It's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so when we behold the Lord's glory, the Greek word for behold there could be contemplate or reflect. So when you worship God, when you meditate on who God is and his glory, when you reflect on his word, you glorify God, and at the same time, inwardly, you are being transformed more and more into that same image by the Spirit of God. So the more we behold God's glory, the more we're transformed into his image. And what is the image of God? The image of God is Jesus In Colossians 1.15, it tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then if we keep reading in Colossians 3 verse 19, it says God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And so if we want to know what the image of God looks like, if we want to know if we are being more and more transformed into the image of God, then we have to look at Jesus. Are we becoming more like Jesus? And you know what? This was God's plan for you from the very beginning, for you to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We read this in Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. There's that word glory, from one degree of glory to another. Your purpose in life is to glorify God by becoming more like God, by being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus, that your life would start to look like Jesus. And so we have to focus on who Jesus is, and we have him in the scriptures to study, to to be with. In John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. And he says in verse 4, I have brought you 
glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And so accomplishing the work that the Father gave Jesus to do, that sounds an awful light like a feat sounds an awful like Ephesians 2.10, that you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for you. So you're God's handiwork. Jesus is talking with his disciples in John 15.8, and he says this, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so now we have this insight of bringing God glory by the work we do and the fruit we produce, engaging and accomplishing the good works prepared in advance for us. And so we're realizing that our purpose in life is now twofold. Our purpose is both becoming and accomplishing. Becoming more like Jesus and accomplishing the work of Jesus. And so the rest of our time this morning, I want to focus on one aspect of the work of God that he has called us to do. And it's summed up in one simple word, serve. To serve. You may have noticed that we've been mentioning four important words lately that help define and guide who we are as a community. And those words are connect, grow, serve, and reach. We connect with one another. We grow in maturity, we serve each other, and we reach out into the world. Now, I want to make a distinction between serve and reach. When we use the word serve, we're specifically talking about how we bless and build up each other within the walls of the church. When we use reach, we're talking about how we bless and build up people in the world outside of the walls of our church. Both are important. We see both in the word of God. But today, I want to focus on serve, one of the ways that we can bless and build up the body of Christ. If your purpose and my purpose is to become more like Jesus, one of the significant ways we become like Jesus and how we fulfill our purpose is to serve one another in this body of believers. So we're going to look at an example from Jesus from Philippians 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, I'll invite you to turn there, but we also have all the the scripture up on the screen here. Philippians 2, 1 through 7. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind, to what? To do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. What is the mindset of Christ Jesus? He was in the very nature God. He did not consider equality with God something to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, humbling himself by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So here we have Jesus, God made flesh, all-powerful, all-knowing, worthy of all praise and glory and honor. He humbled himself and became a servant. So the mindset of Jesus Christ that we're told in Matthew 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. The mindset of Jesus is humility and service. I see this being carried out in two ways within the church community. Two ways that we serve. Number one is use your spiritual gifts. All of you, if you are in Christ, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a believer, you've been given at least one spiritual gift. And you can read more about them in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. But I'm just going to read Romans 12, verses 4 through 6. 
For just as each of us have one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, we all form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Jesus wants you to serve the body as a member of the body with the function and the gift that he's given you. That makes sense, right? Yeah. I'm going to ask my friend Amanda to come out and help me illustrate this. Have you ever had a moment where your belly says, hey, buddy, I could really go for a pumpkin spice donut? (laughs) And your taste buds say, I'm in agreement with that. And then you see your friend Amanda over there. Hey, Amanda. She just happens to have pumpkin spice donuts. Your body needs the hand to work together with the feet to walk on over here, and we need the hand to go pick up this delicious pumpkin spice donut and bring it to the mouth so that the jaw and the teeth can work together to chew the donut over the taste buds so your taste buds can have a pumpkin spice party, right? And demonstrate. Mm. 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 Thank you, Amanda. I only brought those as a sermon illustration to help all you learn the Bible better. (laughs) You have gifts that the rest of the body needs. And when one member of the body isn't functioning, isn't working, isn't serving, the body misses out and it hurts the body. Some of you have amazing gifts that would help bless and build up our body, but we're missing out because you're not serving. The belly, the tongue, the mouth, we all want that pumpkin spice donut, but we need you to be the hand to work together with the feet to pick it up and bring it so we can receive the blessing and be built up. There's a lot that goes on with making the body function and for us to carry out ministry. We can't connect and grow and reach if none of us are serving. I'm gonna run a video that just shows our website homepage and you can see the different opportunities if you click the word serve, serve at living word. And it'll take you to a list where there's all these different places to get involved in our community from guest services, to our next-gen ministries that include Able Life and Transit and Fusion, our high school ministry, worship arts, prayer, even church office stuff. It's tons of ways to get involved, and there's little exclamation points by the areas of extreme need that we really need to feel. And so let me ask you, do you know your gifts? How has God wired and equipped you? I want you to be thinking about how you've been uniquely created to bless and build up this body to serve Christ. That's the first way, using your spiritual gifts. The second way you can serve is to do the dirty work. Do the dirty work. Now, what I mean by dirty work is just doing the acts of service that God puts in front of you. It's doing work that you're not particularly gifted in, but you know you can do it. And I use the phrase dirty work because that's exactly what we see Jesus doing in John chapter 13. He saw literal dirty feet that everyone else was too proud to wash. And in the first century, cleaning dirty feet was the work of a low-level servant. The disciples had all gathered into an upper room, and they were all eating a meal. None of them had cleaned their own feet, and they obviously had not offered to clean each other's feet. And so in John 13, Jesus gets up from the table and he goes over and he pours water into a basin and he wraps a towel around his waist and he takes that water and he goes over to each of the 12 disciples, gets on his hands and knees and begins to wash their feet. And I said this before in my message on hospitality several weeks ago. Jesus didn't take a spiritual gift assessment and find that in his top three spiritual gifts was feet washing, right? 
he did it. He, he, he saw a need among his community of believers, and he served them because it needed done. He set aside the fact that he was their master, their teacher, and their Lord, worthy of all praise, glory, and honor, and he did the work that he saw in front of him. This is what it means to become more like God, to do the work of God. It means putting your status aside, valuing others above yourself, and considering the needs of others in your community. And some of you out there are pretty important people, right? And I say that jokingly. Every one of you is an important person. But here's what I mean by that. In the eyes of the world, some of you have a position in a company or a community of really high status. Maybe you're a doctor, maybe you own your own business, maybe you're a CEO or a president or a vice president, it doesn't matter. All of us have been called by Christ to set our status aside and, and in humility serve. There's no one in here too important to wash dirty feet. Let me just share one quick example of this. He doesn't know I'm gonna share, and um, I don't think he'd, he'd mind, but when, I, when I'm not preaching on Sunday morning, I'm usually walking around the church in different areas, uh, serving in, in kid life or in middle school, just checking things out. And I was walking through the kid life lobby uh, one Sunday morning, and I was walking real funny. I was walking like this. Literally, one member of my body wasn't working the way it should. And this security guard, uh, his name's John, he sees me and he goes, why are you walking like that? And I said, I don't know, my, my back's been hurting for a little bit, nothing major, but about two days ago, my ankle stopped working, and my foot just kept falling flat. And he goes, you need back surgery. Come to find out, the security guard that I see serving regularly every week, every week is a security guard. I mean, serving as a security guard, he's a surgeon. And I had no idea who was a surgeon. And I recently just saw him on TV doing a commercial. And so like, in my mind, this guy's an important surgeon, but he's using his time off to help keep our kids and kid lives safe, to serve and bless the body to bless parents and to bless our kids. I don't know what all goes into going to school to become a surgeon, but I'm pretty sure it was, one of his electives wasn't security guard duty, you know? <laughs> he saw a need and he signed up and served. Now I wanna show a short video of three people who serve at Living Word, and I like this video because it highlights people who serve from a place of gifting, and also people just serving because they saw a need that they know they could meet. So let's just go, go ahead and watch the video here. Hello, my name's Joe. My name's Lilia. My name's Alec. I'm a vocalist. I've just recently started on camera, but I've done lighting for longer. I'm the person on Switch, so anytime that something changes on the main screen, I'm the person that hits the button to change it. And I figured that's something that I can do. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's behind the scenes, it's easy for me to do. It's, it's cool that we get to do something for God in this really awesome way. I, I love the impact that we're able to have on the people and oftentimes they don't realize like everything that goes on and what we're doing behind the scenes but that, I don't think that really matters in the end because what we're doing is serving God and um, yeah. it just it, it creates the experience for them to connect with God. And there, there's a sense of community on the worship team we have a really great time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, it's, it's a party. It's a party sometimes. <laughs> when we come together and we're all working on this thing together for the Lord and for this church, um, the joy is very clear. It's very abundant um, when we're all together doing that. Thing. Yeah, and I mean, the people in this, this group are just so accepting and caring to everyone, and they'll always take time to talk to you. Uh, like hanging out backstage and stuff like that. That is like a great reason to serve. You you come away feeling like you belong and um, it's transformative for sure. And even when you make a mistake, something like that, everybody is willing to help out and uh, work with you on it. So that's pretty cool. I think there's this big misconception of like, oh my goodness, you have to have experience or you have to be technically gifted um, to serve. But it, as long as you have the, the passion for what you're doing, 
we can make anything happen. I mean, the, the training here is just fabulous. So, so don't let that hold you back if, if you're considering um, pursuing something like this. And I know that other guys have, that help with camera have said the same thing. So I would encourage guys that, you know, if you don't want to be on stage, this is something you can help with and we need to help. For Living Word to come around and say, hey, this is what you can do. You can serve God and you can serve everyone in, in your church community um, by using your gifts. So thankful that, that I get to be a part of something like that. It's, it's cool that we get to do something for God in this really awesome way. So. Serving one another within the community of God is part of God's purpose for your life. Even if it's just, I, I know I could push a button so I can do that. Or if it's using your gifts like singing. We were created to be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to serve as Jesus. That's Pastor Brian's uh, with Jesus model that we use in Next Gen for our discipleship. And you were created to serve. Your purpose is to glorify God through blessing and building up, serving one another in the community, using your gifts and engaging in the work that God puts in front of you. We would love it if more people would get involved in our guest services team. When I think about the common grounds area, we need more ministry partners to make that space like it was before the pandemic, where you'd see a bunch of kids running around grabbing donuts and hot chocolate, just enough sugar to send them over to kid life, you know? And we saw people gathering around tables, connecting before and after the service. It was a great hub for connecting with one another within the community. But that connection can only happen if we have more people serving as ministry partners in that area. I want to end our time just by giving one example from Beauty and the Beast. You probably know the story. There was a curse on a castle that turned all the servants in the castle into furniture and uh, appliances. You know, that's what curses do. So Lumiere was a talking candlestick with a French accent. And at one point in the movie, Lumiere sings the hit song, Be Our Guest. Right, you all know it. And in that song, he pulls his buddy Cogsworth into the spotlight and he sings these words. Life is so unnerving for a servant who's not serving. He's not whole without a soul to wait upon. You see, they understood that their identity was servants and that their purpose was to serve guests in the castle. And according to the song, it had been 10 years, 10 years they've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting, needing exercise and a chance to use our skills. Most days we just lay around the castle, right? Flabby, flat, and lazy. You walked in and oopsie-daisy, you know, and then they go the rest of the song. <laughs> if you feel like your life is lacking purpose, let me ask you, are you serving anywhere? Part of your identity, who you are, is that you were created in Christ Jesus. You are God's handiwork, right? You are not your own handiwork. You are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's prepared in advance for you. That's your purpose. That's why you're here. It's why God created you and called you. And so, Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us that the way that you are most glorified is that, is that we transform to become more like you and that you equip us and mold us and shape us to to serve, to do the work that you've called us to do as we are becoming more and more transformed into the image of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.